Hello, good evening, and welcome to today's session on BIC Streams, the very voice of international conscience, the diplomatic life of V.S. Srinivasa Shastri. Joining us today are Vineet Thakur, Assistant Professor, History and International Relations, Leiden University, author of the book, India's First Diplomat, a diplomatic biography of Sastri as India's roving ambassador in the 20s. In conversation with Vineet is Ian Sanjay Patel, LSE Fellow in Human Rights in the Department of Sociology at the London School of Economics and Political Science. Welcome everyone. Uh, I must mention here that we have in our audience two of Srinivasa Sastri's family members, Charaka Raman, his granddaughter, and Indira Chandrasekhar, his great-granddaughter. We will be posting the full bios of our speakers in the chat box. Do post your questions, comments in the Q&A box, which is next to the chat box at the bottom of your screen. With that, over to you, Vineet and Ian. Well, thank you very much, Raghu. And uh, thank you to Bangalore International Center for hosting us uh, this evening. And a very warm welcome to everybody. Uh, I'm very much delighted uh, to be in conversation this evening with Vinny to discuss his uh, very important new book on the premier diplomats of pre-independence India, V.S. Srinivana Sastri. The book is principally a biography of Shastri and introduces us to a fascinating and remarkable human being and diplomat who in the 1920s made a series of astonishing journeys around the world. Uh, and out of a great feat of scholarly labor on Benit's part, uh, this book vividly recreates a very important period in international affairs and brings to life some incredible personalities and political episodes as the age of empires begins to give way to the age of decolonization. And upon finishing this book, I couldn't help but see India's path to independence differently and to recognize the very significant contribution Shastri made to the emerging world of Indian foreign policy, international cooperation, human rights, and international equality. It really is a wonderful book, and uh, it's going to be very interesting to hear uh, Vineet's thoughts on it this evening. So could I begin, uh, Vineet, by asking you to just explain who was V.S. Srinivana Shastri, and how and why did you decide to write uh, an entire book about him? Well, uh, thanks very much, Ian. Uh, let me also start by thanking the Bangalore International Center uh, especially Ravi, Raghu, and Lekha uh, for organizing uh, this event. Uh, I'm truly grateful and honored. Um, uh, also, thank you to those who have joined in um, virtually. Uh, but also, uh, a lot of thanks to you, Ian, for agreeing to conduct us in this format. Uh, and if I be slightly immodest, you know, um, uh, I like to think of my book, although we wrote our own books parallelly, and those of you who haven't read uh, Ian's book, We Are Here Because You Were There, which is sort of a history of sort of uh, uh, immigration in, in Britain, or rather in the British Empire post-1948. Uh, um, uh, and although we wrote our books parallelly, I can't sort of, uh, you know, my book seems to be a prequel to yours, although your book is... Uh, you know, far bigger in, in its uh, sort of uh, in cast of characters and sort of uh, the, the landscape that 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 you have. Uh, so, so I'm also sort of tremendously looking forward to this chat today with you, Ian, and thank you again for uh, uh, doing this. Well, uh, to the question of who was Sastri and why did I choose to write on him, uh, I think uh, I should answer why, because that will also sort of uh, answer the who question. Um, I finished my uh, PhD in 2014 uh, and from JNU and I went to a postdoc in, in South Africa. And when you go to South Africa, you know, as a, as a good Indian boy, you went, I went on a pilgrimage, as they say, to Durban, uh, because that's where Gandhi's Phoenix Ashram is. Uh, but once you go to Durban, um, you know, you, you realize there is this another big monument to uh, the struggles of South, South African Indians. 
uh, which is this college, uh, which is actually a secondary school called Sastry College. That college was started in 1929, uh, but also it's played, in, played uh, an immense role um, in, in, in not just the education of, of, of South African Indians, uh, but also in this in their struggle um, against first segregation and apartheid, because several generations of sort of uh, South African Indians um, uh, studied there. Uh, so, so that institution um, has has a great sort of uh, value in South Africa. Uh, but what was surprising to me, and that was frankly, and I'm quite embarrassed to admit it, that was the first time I'd heard of uh, Sastri uh, or V.S. Srinivas Sastri when I went to Durban. Um, it was embarrassing, but it was also, it also sort of tells you a bit about, you know, my own education in India. I'd finished my PhD and I'd like to think that, you know, I'd, I'd studied quite a bit, but I'd never really heard of V.S. Srinivas Sastri. Uh, so what was surprising then wasn't that Okay, I hadn't heard of Srinivas Sastri, but that, uh, or there isn't much known about him in India, but that uh, there is a monument to him in, in, in a country that he spent only 19 months of his life, where he isn't remembered at all, uh, in the country that he spent 75 years of his life. Uh, and that, in a way, sort of piqued my interest in him. And the more I read about him, um, uh, at that point, I was also writing a short biography of Jan Smuts, uh, who, as you know, Ian sort of... Um, Sastri was the really the first big sort of challenger to Smuts's liberalism at the international stage, and Sastri came pretty much, you know, uh, quite often in my research on Smuts. Um, so, which really then sort of pulled me towards Sastri in writing uh, this book on Sastri. But uh, uh, like it was said in this introduction, it's a diplomatic biography. I am trained in international relations. I'm not a historian. Uh, and I couldn't really write a full-scale biography of 76 years of his life. So I chose to sort of pick a period, which was this 10-year period, where I thought he made immense contributions to um, um, Indian diplomacy, and I call him Indian diplomat, or India's first diplomat. Uh, and I use the term diplomats a bit loosely because he was sort of a roving diplomat in this period. Uh, but Sastri is, of course, much bigger than just that, you know, as a diplomat. He was... Uh, 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 one of the most prominent Indian liberal leaders uh, post Gokhale, um, and 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 the tragedy of sort of you know our history is that we don't remember liberals after Gokhale, while we know a lot about Gokhale and Nowrojis and and uh, Sudhanath Banerjee's and others, uh, but we don't know much about you know liberals who were in that uh, in, in, in who came after the moderates in a way uh, you know walked out of Congress. Uh, so there's this whole generation of liberals like V.S. Srinivas, Sastri, Tej Bahadur Sapru, and others who are very little known. And their contribution to India's constitutionalism uh, is, uh, I, I like to think, is, it's sort of immense. Uh, so Sastri, in a way, is, is, is that figure uh, who, in 1920s, is by far, uh, uh, you know, uh, one of the most well-known liberals in India. Uh, but also he's one of the most well-known Indians outside of India. Um, I think apart from Gandhi and possibly Tagore, uh, he's probably the most well-known Indian uh, outside of India. So that's why uh, I tried, I, I, I wanted to write a book on Sastri. Thank you, Vinny. Uh, yeah, I mean, it's, it's clear already just from those brief comments, just how important Shastri is. Um, and I can certainly relate to the embarrassment of having not known uh, as much as I ought to have done about him prior to reading your book. And, you know, I very much hope that now that you have written this book, that his, that there's a restoration of sorts, uh, which I think is incredibly important. And how interesting also that the, the way that this book began was actually your own journey to South Africa and realizing, you know, Shastri's influence there. And, and I hope we can sort of talk about that. South Africa is one of the, the many places that Shastri uh, visited. Um, and, you know, and as you say, this is, you, you produced a lot of other work on similar figures in the same period. And, and, and I, I also hope uh, as we go forward, we can hear a little bit more about how you ventured into this new world of writing a biography. Uh, and, uh, you know, there's a particular a particular gift we get from biography, and I, and I uh, would be curious to hear more about that. Uh, but before we go further, uh, it'd be useful to hear from you, Vinit, just a little bit more about uh, 
you know, what was this world that Sastri entered as a, a roving diplomat, as you call him? Um, I noticed at one point in the book that you referred to Sastri as an embodiment of a emerging world order. Uh, and, you know, of course, we all know that the 1920s was the interwar period between the great wars. But it was also a time, as you say, when states for the first time are exploring international cooperation uh, in, or in order to promote world peace. And of course, we have the League of Nations uh, by this time. Uh, and this was also a critical period uh, as you animate for us for the British Empire, uh, where major reforms are uh, putting India on a path towards self-government, meaning crucially that it would be an equal partner in the empire alongside the so-called white dominions. That was the phrase at the time, Canada and New Zealand, Australia and South Africa. Um, so I'm obviously I'm familiar with this literature and it's very common to read that the 1920s was a time when there was a strong uh, nationalist sentiment flowing from the white dominions that the British Empire uh, had to reckon with uh, in London. Um, but in the, in the book you go further than this and actually introduce us to uh, a transnational white nationalism uh, and you talk in, ter in terms of uh, a global color line. So, uh, would you mind telling us a bit more about what, what's really at stake in this period, the 1920s, both internationally and in terms of the British Empire, and how India and Shastri in particular fitted into it? Well, uh, thanks for that uh, brilliant question, Ian. Um, I think the, the term that's often used to understand that period, uh, and in fact, even our current period, although the term is, uh, you know, uh, it's it's quite debated now, is the term called uh, liberal internationalism or Wilsonian liberalism. Now, what it means, and uh, I'm, I'm quite surprised actually a lot of people haven't caught on it, it is uh, it, 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 it's, it's trying to understand a contradictory tendency uh, at that period in, 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 in world order. So on the one hand, you have, you know, after the end of the world war, uh, the first world war, um, the crumbling of, crumbling of empires and you know emerges of these sort of sort of national units uh, a smaller national units uh, you have calls for self-determination um, which in my view are erroneously you know uh, attributed to Woodrow Wilson uh, but, but that's another matter uh, but but the idea but the self-determination becomes sort of a very important principle of uh, international politics but at the same time, you have uh, these worries that national sovereignty is leading you to, you know, these wars that no one wants. You know, World War One was seen as a result of the sort of excessiveness of national sovereignty. So there's also this effort to contain sort of sovereignty through either some form of pooling of sovereignty or some sort of collective security arrangement. So League of Nations is uh, you know, uh, one iteration of that sort of thinking, uh, but you have several different ideas of federation, co-federations, uh, you know, um, world federations, uh, ideas of world state are quite dominant in the 1930s. So there's a whole lot of thinking around sort of pooling in sovereignty and not really, you know, uh, sort of creating smaller units. And there is a great tension uh, uh, sort of in these ideas. And that great tension uh, to me also sort of manifests in the idea of the British Commonwealth. And this is what, you know, uh, and this is sort of uh, a work that you've done uh, post 1948. But uh, when I look at the, Brit the idea of the British Commonwealth and I'll explain in the book, um, it emerges out of this constant anxiety that Britain has always had about decline. Uh, and what happens after the second anglo Boer war uh, is that, you know, uh, Britain is obviously concerned about its, its decline, you know, it took us three years to defeat and whatever, uh, 45,000 peasants, uh, you know, uh, uh, so, uh, so there's, a, there's a lot of anxiety about decline, but there's also the emergence of these three sort of powers, uh, Britain, sort of uh, America, and Japan, and, and Germany. So what sort of British thinkers at that period are trying to think of is how do you sort of extend the life of empire 
Uh, and the solution is uh, actually pretty much simple, which is that while at, un until that time, Britain was the one taking care of whatever security responsibilities across the empire, the dominions should start contributing to the defense of the empire. And this is what happens during uh, World War One. Uh, so the idea is very simple that, you know, if you give more powers to the dominions, if you sort of create some sort of federated structure within the empire, which is less hierarchical and more federated, uh, you know, you would also ensure that the dominions participate in this sort of uh, uh, in this sort of new conceptualization, conceptualization of the empire. And this is what is being called as the British Commonwealth, which is moving away from the conception of empire to sort of a more uh, egalitarian. But of course, it's not egalitarian because uh, and that's and that's where India comes in. The second most important question that I think Britain faces is. That while it's all right to bring in dominions and so on and so forth, but 75% of the empire is just one colony, India. Uh, you have to somehow find uh, a way to incorporate India into that empire or into this conception of the British Commonwealth. And then there are different uh, ideas or conceptions of the, the Commonwealth that we can talk about later. Uh, but it is here that, you know, the, the fundamental tension arises where at, on the one hand, you have these dominions becoming more powerful at the level of the empire. So there's a sort of a, uh, um, to use a very classical international relations term, uh, the balance of power shifts from Britain to the dominions, who, as we all know, are far more racist than, than Britain is. Britain, you know, in, in previously, in its, at least in its immigration policies, uh, Britain had found ways to be racist without using race, you know, with these gentlemen's agreements and education tests and so on and so forth, whereas these dominions were hell-bent on sort of controlling uh, immigration within their countries, uh, controlling sort of the white character of these, uh, of, 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 of their dominions, and therefore uh, they wanted more control over immigration policies. Uh, and as they became more dominant at the level of the empire, they legislated a slew of measures in the early 19, late 1900s and sort of 1910s and early 1920s, where you see a slew of sort of anti-immigration measures uh, passed against, specifically against Asiatics, you know, including Indians, uh, which in a way is leading to, you know, um, the rights of Indians being sort of, uh, you know, curtailed. Uh, but it is also leading to what you mentioned earlier, uh, sort of, and this comes from W.E. Du Bois, sort of this global color line where uh, there's this sort of sense of transnational whiteness, where there's a sense of solidarity amongst these white dominions and actually America, because uh, one of the ways in which they pushed Britain uh, uh, to accept these measures is by dangling this prospect of, uh, you know, America being this Republican America being this sort of, you know, uh, uh, this alternative power. Uh, so there is this transnational whiteness, uh, uh, transnational white nationalism. And against it, then, of course, it means that Indians uh, are being sort of, uh, you know, uh, excluded from uh, from ideas of, you know, British Commonwealth and so on and so forth. And that's why where Shastri comes in as somebody who articulates for the rights of Indians uh, in this increasingly racist uh, conception of the British Commonwealth. Thank you, Vinay. So thank you. That really helps us sort of clarify what's going on here. So we have the introduction of self-determination uh, at this time which is obviously a very important concept going forward and whether rightly or wrongly it's associated with uh, Woodrow Wilson. And then we have big changes in the British empire and the growing sovereignty being sort of transferred to form self-governing colonies, white settler self-governing colonies like Australia and New Zealand. And then uh, we also have India uh, being set on a path towards self-government uh, and acknowledged uh, that, that India is moving towards responsible government. So all of a sudden, India has a, uh, uh, a sort of presence uh, within the empire in that sense. Um, so perhaps next then we can learn a little bit more about uh, you know, how Shastri fitted into this, because obviously he was representing both India and also representing the empire simultaneously. And I, I think it'd be really interesting to hear 
more about that. And you know, as you as you said, the the within the title of the book is this notion of liberal internationalism. But we're also talking about the British Empire. So I suppose that we should clarify here that we're living in an age of internationalisms. And one of these internationalisms is uh, these various theories of the British Empire. Uh, and Sastry is sort of implicated in this, in his position as a, a diplomat. Uh, and Shastri himself has a particular theory or vision of the British Empire. So could we hear a little bit more about Shastri's theory of the empire, which is of course referred to at this point as a commonwealth, and how uh, the ways in which he was competing against other versions of the commonwealth, and really what, his, uh, what, what sort of powers had he been given uh, in the 1920s, you know, what sort of powers was, was he enjoying as a, as a diplomat and how did that relate to, to his position within the imperial system? Um, thanks, Ian. Let me first take up the question of, you know, what's his vision of this British Commonwealth? Uh, but I think it's important to sort of first lay out, so what are the visions he's arguing against? Uh, because there are these conceptions of the British Commonwealth. Uh, and in the book, um, uh, there are basically these two broad conceptions of the British Commonwealth. One is associated with um, uh, the Roundtable Group uh, or Lionel Curtis in particular. Uh, and the second is associated with uh, the South African Prime Minister at that point, uh, Jan Smuts. And there's a third version, which actually uh, also I talk about in the book, which is uh, Aga Khan's uh, vision of what, what India's role in the Commonwealth would be. So let me quickly sketch out these and then sort of then place uh, Sastri's vision. Uh, actually, the, the term British Commonwealth was kind of reinvented in a way uh, by Lionel Curtis uh, uh, in 1910. And he was uh, and he was part of this sort of uh, epistemic group called the Roundtable, which at some point was, uh, you know, uh, one of the most important sort of, uh, you know, epistemic uh, groupings within Britain. Uh, they had enormous influence. Um, uh, and the, the, the issue I was talking about earlier uh, that, you know, the British Empire was faced with this sort of uh, existential angst, uh, which is how do you exist with, you know, uh, without sort of, uh, uh, how do you exist? And the solution was that, you know, you delegate powers to the dominions. Uh, so in early 1910s, there was this conception of the organic union that, you know, we all sort of British sister states coming together and forming this sort of racist union, a racist federation where all white people will come together and so on and so forth. Uh, but the clever one amongst these was uh, Lionel Curtis, and he began to argue, uh, along with this other guy called Philip Kerr, uh, who was, who's again, another important figure. But nevertheless, they began to argue that you cannot have a conception of the British Empire without including India in any way, uh, in some way. Uh, and at that point, there were, within India, as you said, Ian, a lot of demands for uh, more reforms, uh, especially India's participation in the war, uh, had been sort of, uh, you know, uh, um, ensured through uh, promises of more reforms. Uh, in fact, even people like Gandhi, for instance, uh, had appealed into Indians to uh, for to recruit in in in, in the British uh, armed forces uh, because, uh, you know, even he expected that there would be reforms after the after the war. Uh, so what Curtis begins to argue is that you cannot. Uh, if you include India in this conception of the British Commonwealth, if you make it, you know, if you give them some sort of uh, representation at the imperial table, what prevents you from giving similar representation to other countries, other colonies like Nigeria or Kenya and, and so on and so forth? And therefore, Curtis begins to argue that we need to deal with this question, not uh, in a sense of, you know, immediacy, but more with a philosophical rigor. And, and therefore he comes up with this whole idea of, uh, and I don't want to bore our audience and go into this conception of the sacramental, uh, the British Commonwealth being a sacramental state. Uh, but essentially the idea is that, you know, within the British Commonwealth, why it is Commonwealth? Because it's not like a liberal state, a social contractualist state. Uh, you participate in the Commonwealth, not out of, you know, asserting your rights, but more because you, you feel a certain sense of duty towards others. And it is this duty towards others that sort of pushes you to become part of the British Commonwealth and all sort of political units and therefore feel similarly. Um, and the catch there was that, uh, and that's how he included India, 
uh, that, uh, you know, one of the things with duties is, uh, or duty of uh, sort of caring about others, is that you can only cultivate it through giving responsibility, through sort of uh, making people responsible. And once you make them responsible, uh, give them some kind of responsibility. It's only that way that you can cultivate a sense of duty towards others. Uh, and that was the way he, which, in which he argued that Indians could be incorporated into the empire because not that because they are equal to everyone else, but because, you know, they are, they're, they're civilized to a certain extent and they've reached a level where, you know, if we give them more responsibility, they will cultivate that sense of duty and become equal members of the empire at some point in the future. So there's this sort of, it's a very sort of specious, you know, uh, sort of conceptualization of British Commonwealth, but that's, that, that was uh, Curtis's conception. Against this is Jan Smuts's conception, which is more of this, you know, uh, organic union, or organic white union. He, he thought of the British Empire as sort of a mini league of nations, where members of the British Empire came together, not because, you know, uh, whatever, of some conception of duty, but because there was symbolic uh, sovereign that everyone, you know, uh, 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 you know, uh, um, everyone was ready to come under, uh, and also some sort of innate British values like rule of law and so on and so forth that everyone in that Commonwealth agreed, and therefore they are British Commonwealth. Now, Aga Khan um, takes on um, uh, Lionel Curtis's conception and begins to argue that one of the ways in which uh, you know countries in the past, especially the dominions in the past have asserted their civilization, have asserted their duties is through colonization. It's when they have colonized other people that they have shown to the rest of the empire that they are ready enough for self, uh, you know, uh, determination or uh, institutions of uh, uh, self-governance. Uh, and he argued that, you know, in Australia, these, uh, you know, these in the white dominions, basically white people colonize, you know, non-whites and that's how they showed that they could govern. and. After that, they were given institutional self-governance. So Agha Khan begins to argue that India should do the same. You know, Kenya should be given to uh, India to govern. And once Indians are able to show that they, they would be able to govern Kenya, that would mean that they could also, they also deserve institutional self-governance and they could be, become equal part of the uh, uh, empire or, or the Commonwealth. The Sastri sort of, uh, and I, I, I genuinely think Sastri is, is Perhaps the most devastating critique of uh, uh, Lionel Curtis's, you know, the specious conception of the British Empire, because the first thing he says, uh, apart from all the other criticisms, uh, is, well, if you look at Australia, Canada, whatever, New Zealand, and even Britain, when they got institutions of self-governance, all of them were barbarian. You know, they didn't know, they didn't, they didn't have enough people to sort of uh, uh, to cultivate forms of self-governance. They didn't have people to run these institutions of self-governance. But they were given institutions of self-governance, uh, including sort of in Britain in 1832. And when you did that, people learned how to govern. And people through trial and error, you know, eventually became sort of whatever, uh, you know, civilized enough to govern and so on and so forth. Uh, so his argument was that when you have done that with the rest of the empire, why not do it with India? Why not give Indians sort of institutions of self-governance, irrespective of whatever stage of civilization Indians were in? But also he begins to argue that Indians are actually in much more advanced stage than any other dominion or even Britain had been in the past when they got institutional self-governance because Indians had a large sort of by then uh, uh, a large number of administrators and politicians who had shown in the past whatever five decades and that they are able to sort of work with modern institutions of secular governance and so on. So also therefore India was completely ready to actually have institutions of self-governance and be an equal member of the empire. Uh, and that in a way was his, his, his argument for what he called the British Commonwealth was that India, you know, you cannot have a British Commonwealth without India being an equal member of the empire. That was the first condition of the Commonwealth being a Commonwealth. Otherwise it's just a racist Commonwealth. It's, it's just a racist sort of organic union. So I don't know if I've been able to explain it well, but sort of broadly that's, that's, that's a sketch of what he was trying to argue. Actually, yeah, I think that's that's really helpful in the sense that it helps us realize that at this time it wasn't just a sort of a monolithic empire versus uh, you know nationalist politics in in India. It's actually there's actually diversity uh, within the British Empire uh, 
and it's not simply it's not simply a monolithic system of rule but it's there there's diversity of ideas that are kind of there's lots of uh, intellectual and political trends within it which are competing with one another some are more egalitarian than others and Shastri's is obviously as you as you just said it's the most decisively egalitarian vision of the empire and, and really we, we see a crisis of uh, liberal imperialism trying to adapt to changes in the international order and, and of course as the decades go on that that idea of self-determination would would eventually become a firmly anti-colonial one um, so it's very interesting to see this uh, this competing international scene here and the way that Sastry is now in the middle of it and and of course in the book you describe um, a series of journeys that he that he made um, uh, international delegations that he represented uh, the empire and and India on and he travels uh, to uh, places to white dominions he travels to Australia New Zealand South Africa Canada uh, London and uh, and you know this is this uh, in many ways is the most sort of um, incredible sections of the book to sort of uh, when we read about these physical journeys that Shastri took and how uh, interesting they were and um, I, I'm really looking forward to hearing more about uh, those journeys themselves that he took in the 1920s um, but from what you just said it, it's clear that Shastri is uh, presenting us with a vision of the empire based uh, on equality and based on and on rights. And as you mentioned earlier, he's of course representing the rights of Indians overseas, because of course, uh, overseas Indians are resident in the white dominions. There we have many overseas Indians in East Africa, Southern Africa, uh, Australia and, and, and Canada. And, and principally Shastri is speaking to, uh, to their citizenship rights. Um, as British subjects, um, but as you as you also mentioned, there's a much bigger. Uh, the political stakes are, are are actually bigger than simply the rights of overseas Indians, because we're at stake is actually a vision of what the empire is becoming amid an even bigger international order that involves uh, America. So you know, could you say a little bit more about how Shastri? negotiates his position within the British imperial world to which he both belongs um, and is also uh, has a, a difficult position um, within. He's, he's making pleas for citizenship rights of overseas Indians, but it, this is very much dependent on his own, uh, uh, his own representation of an Indian claim to sovereignty. But of course, India is still a crown colony at this time. So Sastri can't really in, uh, in, uh, invoke a universalist theory of rights. He has to advocate for uh, the rights of overseas Indians and the equality of the British Empire from within the challenging position of India's uh, very uh, nascent claim to sovereignty. Uh, and there's some really interesting descriptions of the sort of the contradiction, the very embattled and contradictory position of Shastri within the book. It's a, at times it feels like he's put in an impossible situation. So he's both an emblem of the British Empire, but he's also referred to as authentically Indian. He's recognized as authentically Indian. You refer to this, this uh, one point in the book, he's referred to as an apostle of reconciliation. So this is, of course, his conciliatory effect within the empire. But at the same time, he's clearly a political agitator and refers to himself as, as such. He's also at the very heart of the imperial establishment. He's even sworn in to the, to the Privy Council, to Britain's Privy Council. And yet he's very much uh, India's uh, plenipotentiary. He's, he's, he's very much attached to the Indian claims to, to sovereignty. So the, uh, you have this phrase in the book that he's a native diplomat. So could you help us clarify this briefly, this position that Sastri held? 
Thanks, Ian. I mean, there's actually a set of questions that I hope I, 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 you know, I'm able to sort of justice to at least some of them. Uh, so let me first, uh, you know, uh, actually for, you know, for those who tuned in, sort of sketch out what were these journeys and why, I, why do I call him sort of India's first diplomat? Uh, I mean, the claim, uh, as, I, as I say in the conclusion, wasn't made necessarily in a very thick technological sense or not technical technical sense that you know oh he was the first one to sign something and therefore he's the first diplomat but i think it's uh one i'm taking sort of a broader definition of what a diplomat ought to be but uh but i think he uh in a way was somebody who one sustained with uh you know performed a sustained function of a diplomat for for the longest for about 10 years uh from 1920 1919 to 1929 uh but also because uh he is at the very origins of you know ideas of diplomacy in india or ideas of modern diplomacy in india so he is in in many ways a diplomatic entrepreneur uh a lot of what in a lot of india's diplomatic positions depend largely on his person on on the personal skill that he has rather than the institutional structures that sort of you know are uh uh, that support him. So, for instance, I argue in the book, you know, um, you know, uh, India's first bilateral agreement, in fact, the first ever bilateral agreement within the British Empire, which did not involve Britain, was between India and South Africa, the Cape Town Agreement in 1927. Uh, and Sastry played a sterling role uh, in that. And, 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 and I'll talk about, uh, since you've asked, you know, his conceptions of the whatever uh, uh, idea of rights. Because he sort of enunciates a certain idea of rights in that in that declaration, uh, um, which which is which is truly spectacular. Um, but before I come to that, uh, so you know, uh, but even in a technical sense, uh, I argue that he could be characterized as India's sort of first diplomat because he was the first person to have actually plenipotentiary powers. Although you know, in 1919, uh, uh, in a Paris Treaty, there were Indians who signed on to you know. Um, uh, uh, I think Sir Gangaram and and uh, Satyendra Sena they signed on to the the League of Nations treaty, uh, but of course uh, the, the the primary signature was of the Secretary of State on behalf of India. But when he goes to Washington and the Washington Naval Treaty, he is actually given the powers on behalf of India uh, to sign without anyone sort of looking over him. So uh, in a technical sense, also he is India's first diplomat. Uh, so the book in the book I look at uh, one his first tour to uh, England, which is in 1919 um, for the Montague Chelmsford for uh, reforms, and I argue that he plays a very instrumental role in those reforms. Uh, and then uh, his second tour is in 1921 uh, when he goes as part of the railway committee, but then uh, he is uh, India's sort of uh, main representative uh, at the Imperial Conference, which is the first Imperial Conference under new conditions uh, in 1921. And uh, he he plays an absolutely wonderful role in you know in passing a resolution uh, which uh, for the, uh, which was a resolution of racial equality which was passed for the first time ever in the history of British Empire, uh, and Sastry is the architect of that. But I think the diplomatic maneuvers behind that uh, you know how the resolution got passed were you know all white dominions uh, you know uh, supported India. Uh, against a fellow white dominion, South Africa. That's quite spectacular how that was achieved. In fact, South Africa not only, um, South Africa also didn't oppose the resolution. It actually just sort of uh, abstained from the resolution. So I, I sort of, I go into details about sort of uh, about that. But then uh, he goes on this dominion tour uh, to Australia, New Zealand and Canada, you know, which is uh, sort of a first ever public diplomacy tour by an Indian. Uh, after that, uh, he goes to the Washington Conference, as I said, as India's plenipotentiary. And although he does not really play, uh, you know, a huge role in the conference as such, I mean, as in sort of as a representative of India, which really didn't have much to do with, you know, naval conferences. India didn't really have a navy, uh, but there, there, but there's sort of there's, you know, as uh, but to him, participating on behalf of India in such a conference uh, is an affirmation of, you know, India's sort of uh, dominion equality uh, in some ways. Uh, and thereafter, he goes uh, to Kenya. Uh, he goes to London on a mission about Kenya, and I argue in the book how that really breaks his heart because that was the first time ever when 
the British Parliament, a British Parliament passes a racist resolution, a resolution that sort of, uh, you know, um, uh, 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 you know, that racially, uh, uh, that sort of has uh, imposes racial restrictions on Indians, and that really breaks his heart, uh, quite literally, because he falls sick and, and so on and so forth. Uh, and then, you know, he he falls sick and then he uh, quite literally actually semi-retires uh, from politics uh, until he's brought back um, by Lord Irwin's government um, to go to South Africa on, on a mission uh, um, for the Cape Town Agreement. And I and, and sort of uh, I sort of detail uh, the kind of role he played in, in that sort of very important uh, uh, you know, agreement, uh, and as I as I've said, that was the first ever bilateral agreement within the empire. And and given his success, and you know the kind of role he played, uh, he then was asked to uh, sort of go to South Africa as for India's first agent. Which I also argue that in the book that although before him, you know, they were India had sent agents, uh, but this was actually the first position of its kind within the empire, where he went to a fellow Dominion. Uh, in the capacity of uh, sort of almost an ambassador. Uh, and it became an ambassadorial position primarily because it was him who, who because he was a privy councillor, he could not have been under protocol. He had to be given privileges which were equal to sort of a minister in South Africa. Therefore, the position itself, he raised the position, which was generally a bureaucratic position to a uh, position of ambassador. By his own personality and his, his two years in South Africa were, uh, I, I mean, are still remembered uh, by far. I mean, in, in, in the Indian South African bilateral history from 1919 to 1994, I think those two years uh, of his tenure are by far um, the best ever relations India had with South Africa and given the context. So this is sort of the broad landscape in which or sort of the events which I sort of, uh, you know, uh, talk about in the book. Uh, now, coming to the conception of rights, um, you know, you're absolutely right. You know, he is he doesn't take a moral position when it comes to equality, because, like you said, he's a diplomat. He has to function uh, as a diplomat for India. And he realizes that arguments about, you know, universalist moralist arguments about equality and, and blah, blah, blah. You know, everyone agrees to them. But no one really is ready to put their sort of, you know, uh, uh, you know, whatever stamps and signatures on it, you know, uh, because people, people like Smuts and others are very easily able to sort of, you know, uh, walk out of their sort of high, sort of hi-fi ideas uh, when it comes to actual real politics. Uh, so his argument was always, in a way, uh, about, you know, Indians being given equal rights within the empire because India was an equal member of the empire. So it was an argument for Indian sovereignty uh, rather than an argument about racial equality. And what happens is uh, that in the, in, especially after the Kenya uh, verdict, uh, you know, before that, Indians like Sastri had appealed to this whole argument about imperial citizenship, that, you know, we are all equal subjects of the British empire and therefore Indians ought to be treated equal to, you know, white Australians and everyone else. Uh, but post uh, post Kenya, uh, uh, one of the things that and I, I kind of feel it's a very sort of significant moment in Indian diplomatic history. What happens is when Britain is not really able to sort of you know uh, uh, force the Dominions to sort of retract their uh, you know anti-immigration laws, which are specifically against Indians, uh, and in fact going further, the British Parliament passes a racist law. Uh, Britain basically tells Indians when Indians agitate against it that, you know, we are living under a new British Commonwealth where all dominions are autonomous internally and likewise India is autonomous in internally. So why don't you deal with these uh, dominions at, at bilateral level? Don't come to us. So in a way, and then India gains sort of uh, what I call a vicarious form of sovereignty and equality with the dominions because, you know, Britain really can't help Indians. And at that moment, I think somebody like Sastri, when he goes out as a diplomat, really shines. Because what he does, and that's sort of the brilliance of the Cape Town Agreement, there's a sentence there, uh, which is very clever, uh, where he argues that, uh, where it was written by him, uh, and I'm paraphrasing, which says something to the effect that it is the responsibility of any civilized governments to take care of its uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, of its of its permanent population, 
Now, what it means is it's saying to the South African government that you become civilized only when you take care of welfare responsibilities of everyone who is inside in, 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 your, uh, in, in your country. And this is appealing to an Afrikaner government, which has its own sort of sensitivities regarding civilization, because they are sort of seen as sort of inferior versions of whites and so on and so forth. So, you know, the, he sort of flips this idea of civilization and basically tells a white government that you only become civilized when you provide for welfare for Indians, um, you know, your permanent population. So in a way, he sort of, uh, you know, uh, his, his arguments actually evolved with with, with the changing contours of the British Empire. And that's why I, I think he sort of, uh, you know, he, he, he does a sterling job uh, as, as a diplomat. And lastly, the, the point about native diplomat, and, and I, I, I talk about it in, in the introduction where I'm, I'm quite fascinated by, by Sastri as a, as a diplomat. And I, I wanted to see why, why would Britain send somebody like Sastri who is, like you said, uh, he, he's an Anglophile. He loves, you know, uh, whatever, Britain, and in a way is, is very much in agreement with British ideas of rule of law and so on and so forth. Uh, but he's also a political agitator in the sense that he pushes Britain to live by its ideals, and not just Britain, but everyone, you know, all the white dominions live by their ideals, that if, you're, if British empire is about rule of law and equality, then you might as well, you know, enshrine those principles into your practice. Um, and I kind of think that it's because of, you know, um, the purpose of colonialism, we often think is sort of to produce these mimic men, right, to use the Asnip Naipaul term that, you know, to produce these sloppily assembled derivatives of the colonizer, you know, these sort of uh, brown saps. Uh, I think it's it's actually slightly more um, sort of the, you know, the raison d'etre, I don't know how, if I pronounce it right, of uh, colonialism is not really producing sort of mimic men, but it's sort of uh, producing these people who are um, who are manifestly original but also sufficiently compliant uh, who are you know um, who 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 are very secular who are who live by British ideals and so on and so forth but also have their own minds to think and that's where I think colonialism really gets its high you know when when you produce individuals like that and Sastri is a perfect example of somebody who is uh, who's very uh, I mean uh, He's very pro-British. I mean, these values of rule of law, and he's sort of uh, he, you know, like I said, he loves the empire. Uh, but he's also a thinking man. He's somebody who uh, brings that sense of Oriental sagacity to Western forbearance. He marries the two, uh, which then creates also, but creates problems for him because he has to walk this thin line between this, you know. Uh, uh, sort of this, uh, uh, you know, assertive exceptionalism that he is exceptional to, you know, uh, to Indians. Uh, uh, but it's also a sort of a disempowering fetishization. You know, he's fetishized in a, as a whatever silver tongued orator and so on and so forth who speaks brilliantly, blah, blah. Uh, but he has to find his agency within, within that sphere. And that's what I think he does that brilliantly. He walks the tight rope where he is able to sort of, you know, um, project himself as sufficiently compliant. Uh, and he's able to walk these, you know, uh, uh, in these to these conferences and speak to these, uh, you know, white leaders uh, with a level where, you know, he, he's seen sort of pro-Britain, but also at the same time, hold them accountable uh, uh, to not become completely disempowered. So that's, that's where this whole thing about a native sort of uh, diplomat comes. But that comes with, and if, if I could just add, uh, there are also dangers of this because his own exceptionalism, you know, when he's presented as this exceptional figure, but exceptional to whom? Exceptional to his own people, which leads to whole sets of issues about that while he's sort of, uh, you know, uh, given entry into these white spaces, but that is used, uh, his exceptionalism is used as a reason actually to not give entry to everyone else. Uh, it's argued that, oh, Sastri, we are fine with Sastri, because he is this whatever wonderful, you know, exceptional Indian, uh, but precisely because he's exceptional, you know, it allows for, you know, the common Indian sort of coolie, whatever, uh, that there is a term used for Indians, they ought to be kept sort of disenfranchised because they are not exceptional. So, so there, are, there are dangers with this sort of exceptionalism of, of the native diplomat uh, of, of, of uh, that that actually becomes. Thank you, Vinay. That, you know, that really helps us uh you know, summon this image of uh, Sastri as an incredibly forceful personality. And uh, we're, we're, 
we before we move on to the Q and A, and I can see that already there's some questions. I just wanted to, because you raised some very interesting points there. Um, I think we should acknowledge also uh, that you know Swastri is deeply at odds with the ascendancy of non-cooperation domestic nationalist politics in India in the 1920s, and uh, you know. This is the age of the anti-colonial boycott and Shastri is very much operating within the procedures of the imperial system. Now, there's a very interesting comment where, you, where Shastri uh, says that Gandhi's tactics were worse than the disease of imperialism. And um, uh, Nehru describes Shastri as an imperial envoy and in return, Shastri calls Nehru uh, a spoiled youth. Uh, and you have this uh, comment in the book that Shastri is uniquely misunderstood, but I think it speaks to, uh, you know, this sort of, he's embattled on all sides, really, both uh, domestically and internationally. And we also you very powerfully gave us this sense of Shastri's personality. And, um, you know, in the book, that's one of the most interesting features. Uh, and he's, he's very much the foil. He's a foil to Gandhi to Nehru, Churchill uh, and others. He's unlike anybody else. And a part of this is his famed uh, oratorical skills, which were deemed by Western onlookers to be all the more astonishing because he had not gone to Oxford or Cambridge. He sort of seems to em embody this mastery of the English language uh, and also this particular sort of embodiment of dignified moderation. Uh, and he was incredibly self-effacing and you even point out in the book that he wanted no monuments uh, left to him or nor any biographies to remember him uh, interestingly and which is which i think is quite uh, remarkable and also you gave us a sense of you know the, the remarkable labor involved uh, with the journeys themselves these journeys to these diplomatic missions to australia new zealand canada South Africa, Washington, and London, often in quick succession. He has an incredibly busy schedule and it comes at an enormous personal cost to his health. He leaves uh, his wife, Lakshmi, and his daughter at home. Um, he, he is exposed to death threats and arson and even a gas bomb during his, his tour. And on top of this, he's being described as irrelevant and a sort of stooge of uh, imperialism. Um, so could you, indicate uh, just a little bit about, you know, what was going on here? How much of this personality, this presentation, how much of it was uh, a sort of a calculated strategy and how much of it was very much part of uh, who he was and consistent with his beliefs? Um, and I know I've given you sort of a lot to, to think about there, but uh, anything you, uh, any further thoughts you might give us would be wonderful before we move on. Um. Thanks again, Ian. Well, uh, I mean, so this, this academic Grady Smith once wrote that, you know, um, Sastri's liberalism came quite out of his character. You know, he was somebody who was moderate in his behavior. Uh, you know, he's uh, quite an affable person. Uh, somebody, like you said, he's quite self-facing, but he was also moderate in, in his own personal conduct. Uh, you know, one of the Australians said, there's too much restraint in the man, you know. <laughs> Uh, and and a lot of that come came from I think uh, his upbringing where you know I think his father was quite volatile but his mother was a very calming influence one of his teachers was a very calming influence so he had that sense of you know uh, moderation in his personality which also reflected in in his political views and 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 so on and so forth uh, but also he was you know he was trained for it in some level by people like Gokhale uh, when he went to servants of India society and so on and so forth. Uh, but one of the things that that you gestured towards, Ian, uh, this whole thing about, you know, how do you evaluate somebody who's, you know, uh, like you said, he's kind of hated by everyone, uh, <laughs> you know, uh, um, and 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 that was, I think, you know, uh, writing biographies can be terrifying because you know you're always biased towards the person, you know, in a way you live with them, you see them in the everyday sort of context, there you read the letters, and you kind of feel for the person in some ways, you're always empathetic towards them. So it's very, it's kind of impossible to form, you know, stark judgments about them in terms of good and evil or hero and villain, you know, uh, as you know, as I wrote a short biography of Jan Smuts and, 
uh, it was written in the background of Rose Must Fall, and I was constantly worried if I was, you know, if I'm allowed to be even slightly sympathetic to a, a figure like him who was responsible for segregation. Uh, with Sastri, I think it's quite, I mean, not, not to that extent, but it's quite similar because, uh, like you said, he was considered sort of a stooge of the British Empire. Uh, and so it has been very easy to dismiss him in our, in, in our historiography. Uh, it is also, I think, sometimes very easy to write a revisionist history where you just praise the person, uh, uh, where you do exactly the opposite. You just flip it. You do exactly the opposite of what the critics have done. You know, just pick on some, uh, whatever, some aspects and then praise them. Uh, uh, or, uh, and then go on to argue that, no, these liberals also resisted the empire in their own way and so on and so forth. Uh, and that's where I think I find a problem that, you know, um, a framework where you have to see somebody either as a traitor or as a revolutionary, you know, a collaborator or a resistor uh, does, I think, disservice to both the person and these categories. Uh, in fact, how far can one stretch the idea of resistance itself, right? Um, so I wanted to move beyond these categories and, and strangely, actually, the most uh, uh, sort of uh, important person to frame how I look at Sastri was Gandhi. Um, Gandhi being sort of, you know, Gandhi and Sastri were at sort of different you know, at completely opposite end of the political spectrums, but the amount of love that they had for each other and respect for each other's work. Uh, in fact, both came to each other's defense when their own followers were, you know, going after uh, after them. And that kind of relationship uh, is, is kind of very rare. Uh, but also I think it, it allows you to sort of see people in new light. And, and that, that's sort of the way, that's the way I looked at Sastri. You know, you look at Sastri, I wouldn't say in terms of the context and blah, 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 because, you know, that can often serve as sort of an apology of somebody. Uh, but as sort of a, you know, if I'm doing a sociology of sort of imperial diplomacy, to me, so, you know, you can't write that without a figure like Sastri, who is uh, in incredibly creative in how he sort of, you know, engages with 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 this extremely restrictive, uh, uh, you know, uh, structure that he, that he is part of. And he's extremely genuine about it. Uh, he does not hide, you know, he does not, he does not say something and do something else. He's extremely consistent throughout the 20s and 30s and, and 40s. Uh, so, so that's why how, how I see him sort of uh, personally, somebody who's led an incredibly rich life. But also liberals are kind of very boring to write biographies of because, you know, they never, uh, you know, there's never gushes of wild action in their life. And similarly with Shastri, Everything is pretty stayed, you know, his, his views are pretty stayed. Uh, his, his speeches, I mean, everyone talks about, like you mentioned, his him being the silver tongue orator and, and wonderful speaker. Uh, but if you read his speeches, uh, I mean, they are so wonderfully constructed, uh, but they're never, they never rouse you to, you know, whatever, uh, feelings of patriotism or whatever. They are very rational in terms of how he argues. Uh, uh, so it's it's everything is in moderation with Sastri, uh, which is uh, which can be a problem for a biographer, but it's sort of incredibly refreshing too. Thank you, Billy. Um, yes, I mean we we haven't spoken yet about uh, you know Shastri's legacy, both for um, for India and internationally, and maybe in when we move to the Q and A now, perhaps you could bear that in mind. But you know, I, yes, it, it's interesting to, to to hear you talk about you know this 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 particular nature of his constitutional vision. And uh, you have this lovely quote in the book that Shastri's ma mantra was to wait, wait in patience, which seems to sort of get to the heart uh, of what he was prepared to do. But it's remarkable what he was able to achieve from within uh, those constrained uh, conditions. So uh, let's have some questions. So I have a question here, the first one. Um, asking, uh, wasn't Aga Khan criticized in India for racist attitudes towards Kenya? Well, I mean, um, the simple answer would be yes. <laughs> uh, uh, so, yeah, I mean, Aga Khan uh, had, had, had very specific views about how India should deal with Kenyans and so on and so forth. Uh, but he was criticized uh, even within India. Uh, Congress distanced itself from, from that point of view, so yes. Brilliant. Um, somebody else asks, are there any recordings of Shastri's speeches? 
Well, that's that's the sad part. I haven't been able to find any. Um, and and uh, so as a as a biographer, uh, and that's my one major regret. So if anyone has access in the audience, uh, I've been trying to find, but I haven't been able to find them. But uh, I would say though, I think uh, great quality of soft free speeches. If you read them, they're remarkably oral. You can literally hear his musical voice if you if you read the speeches. I know it sounds a bit dramatic, but you know it is really that way. Uh, and 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 the way he constructs his sentences, I think that's that's quite remarkable. We have another question actually on that same point. Uh, could you tell us anything more about his fame for uh, for English? Um, um, and uh, a ref can you tell us anything more about what these disputes were at the time about the correct English or the best kind of prose for uh, a, a scholar statesman at the time? Well, I mean, you know, he's uh, the only thing he's remembered for is being the silver tongue orator. And I have tried to sort of de-emphasize that aspect in, in the book uh, because uh, I kind of feel that Sastri is much more than in his English, uh, you know, his, his ability to sort of speak a certain language. But of course, he was a remarkable uh, speaker. I mean, even in, in even in Australia, he could fill a room like David Lloyd George would. Uh, uh, and so, everywhere he's praised for his or whatever uh, his his speeches and, and his his ability to articulate views and so on and so forth. Um, uh, but there's, I mean, for trivia, he also, I mean, Gandhi's autobiography. You know, he edited it for English. Uh, uh, he spent a number of hours uh, between 1936 to 1939 correcting Gandhi's English and so on and so forth. Uh, and there are sort of various stories about him correcting Churchill and, and, and a whole lot of other people. But uh, but sort of, but I, I do want to say this and I say it in the book that, you know, our obsession with his, uh, with his, with his English in a way also speaks a lot about us that, you know, uh, we really feel like if somebody speaks good English, they are, you know, that's that's the measure of that ca their character, uh, which is what I try to de-emphasize. I, I do think you have to sort of think of sorcery much beyond, uh, you know, how we spoke. It was, it was a very important part of his personality, but uh, but there's a lot more. Thank you, Vinay. Uh, we have another question here uh, asking you to tell us a little bit more about these these uh, journeys by ship that Shastri was taking. He's he's abroad for long stretches of time uh, as a guest of the Indian government. Uh, and how did this, uh, Shastri is a Tamil Brahmin, and how did this upbringing of Shastri's affect the way he conducted himself abroad and how he, how it affected his experience and how he handled these trips? Well, um, thanks very much for that question. In fact, um, one of the things that I talk about in the book uh, is about sort of caste and diplomacy and caste and foreign policy and the kind of role that it plays in, in diplomacy. And with Sastri, it's particularly sort of important. Um, not necessarily in terms of, you know, what he ate and how he whatever preserved his uh, Brahminism and so on and so forth. I think at a, at a personal level, he was fairly secular uh, and he was fairly, you know, um, uh, 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 somebody who didn't who didn't worry that much about sort of transgressing, you know, uh, sort of Brahmin values and so on and so forth. Uh, uh, although he stuck to a non-vegetarian diet, and and but uh, you know, uh, uh, but in, but in his personal conduct with others, uh, probably caste didn't play that much of a role in the external sphere. Although you know, in his uh, uh, I mean, I mean, uh, Condina Rao says in his in his biography of Sastri that you know. And there was only one instance where you know um, somebody from you know depressed classes were allowed in their house, which is actually when Gandhi brought uh, somebody. Uh, and I can't attest to you know what what happened in Sanskrit's person conduct. But what I'm interested in the book is uh, looking at sort of the kind of role that caste uh, plays in in his, his conduct of diplomacy. And there, uh, you know, I, I argue in the book that he's quite aware of how his him being a Tamil Brahmin allows him access into a lot of spaces where, you know, the Indian overseas is actually generally identified as the coolie, you know, uh, sort of the Shudra. Uh, and him being a Tamil Brahmin uh, is always sort of, uh, you know, shown as an exception. Uh, and his entry uh, into whatever, 
white spaces and white governments and meeting white whatever leaders and so on and so forth uh, is quite reflective actually of his sort of you know caste status um, and 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 as a result I also argue in the book that in, even in his diplomacy he performs uh, what I call a performative Brahmanism where there is a lot of emphasis on entry on the Sanskritization where you know in his diplomacy he, in South Africa for instance he plays a lot of emphasis on Indians like him being allowed entry into these white spaces, speaking white universities, you know, uh, speaking white publics and so on and so forth. Uh, a lot of people seem that to be uh, uh, the measure of progress. Uh, but of course, uh, he's actually the only one who's ever allowed into those uh, uh, sort of spaces. There's a whole lot of focus also on hygiene and, and cleanliness uh, in terms of, you know, uh, so his whole sort of pitch in South Africa with regard to sort of the coolies is that they needed to uplift, you know, to Western civilization. So there's a lot of focus on sanitization and so on and so forth, which, you know, has a sort of, you know, which sort of has sort of connotations of Brahminism about them. But he's also quite aware of uh, the problems with caste. Uh, in fact, uh, one of the things that he says repeatedly in South Africa is he kind of equates caste and race uh, and argues that you know, caste actually has destroyed India. Do you want South Africans, you know, that race should destroy you too. So therefore, you know, there are parallel lessons that you can learn that just as because of our casteism, we've been, you know, uh, we've sort of degenerated as civilization. Similarly, you know, uh, uh, you know, you, you could learn same lessons from us. So, so he deals with these questions of caste at several levels uh, beyond just his personal conduct. Thank you, Vinay. Uh, we still have time for a few more questions if anybody else wants to, to put them in the chat box. So next we have a, a, a very nice comment from Arati Rahman, who, is, uh, who says that her, her mother, who is uh, 91 years old, is Shastri's uh, gra uh, granddaughter and uh, one of two surviving grandchildren of Shastri. And she remembers him very fondly uh, and spent a lot of time with him growing up. And she would like to, to thank you, Vineet. She's listened to the talk and enjoyed it very much. Uh, and thanks you for your work uh, on the family's behalf and hopes that she can talk with you uh, after this. Um, so, uh, as I say, please do add on uh, any other questions you may have. We still have a bit of time. Uh, perhaps I could, uh, use the time just to say, uh, you know, you, you, uh, you mentioned Vineet that his trip to his, the episode revolving the rights of um, uh, overseas Indians in, in Kenya, uh, that Shastri was not able to sort of move British policy towards a sort of egalitarian solution to that, and that actually the colonial office capitulated to the demands of white settlers in in Kenya and you said that it broke his heart which is you know uh, and, and, I, and I can say having read the book that it, it is one one absolutely feels this uh, this the enormous sacrifice that Shastri made and the and how much this Kenya question meant to him and it and after this is not resolved properly it leads to a bout of ill health on Shastri's part so you know, if we if we move towards the the end of Shastri's life um what's his final view and your final view on uh Shastri's relationship to the empire did these these remarkable uh journeys that he took in the 1920s was he left uh was his faith in the empire left intact would you say or not? Thanks. Yeah, that's a very important question because um, I think even late into sort of 1940s, um, uh, he didn't really agree with India's independence, the idea of India becoming independent. What he wanted India to become was a dominion. Uh, now, of course, he was you know, uh, uh, way out of sync with his times, <laughs> uh, because by then, you know, there was an independence movement and so on and so forth. But if you think about it, you know, in 1947, India actually became a dominion, uh, just like other dominions. And his argument then was that how is independence different from a dominion? Australia, South Africa, Canada, everyone have the same rights. It's just that, you know, they maintained the British connection and he was quite sentimental about British connection because of, you know, uh, ideas of justice, the rule of law and so on and so forth, and not really some fealty to the queen. 
uh, or the king at that point. Uh, but, uh, and if you, if you think about it, uh, although Nehru, like you mentioned, Nehru and Sastri in a way, you know, didn't see eye to eye, uh, but post-independence India was kind of, you know, uh, it's, it's something that, you know, uh, Sastri would entirely agree with. Uh, India remained part of the Commonwealth. So all he wanted was some kind of connection to maintain with, uh, with, with, with Britain because he saw value in it. But apart from that, uh, I don't think there was substantive difference. Now, what I would also though say is that in our sort of presentist versions of history, you know, we like to think that, you know, whatever, you know, these people who were asking for dominion status in the 20, sort of 1920s were really, you know, these horrible folks who, you know, who were stooges to the British and everything. But everyone wanted dominion status in the 1920s. Uh, that was the form of independence. It was only when you know Nehru and everyone started talking about sort of full independence uh, and so on and so forth in the 1930s that Congress really be started believing in it. So to single out liberals, I think is sort of gross injustice to uh, you know uh, to uh, the point of views. Uh, and I do think that they were actually far more clearer in terms of what they wanted than even people like Gandhi in the 1920s because it wasn't clear what Gandhi wanted. Thanks so much, Nate. Yeah, I really think that helps us clarify uh, how we can see Indian politics differently at this time. Um, so maybe I could just end by saying, you know, this is also a uh, a story. It's it's a it's a it's a crucial story for India's path to independence. Um, but it's it's also a story about the broader broader international history in the 1920s. Now, um, most of us are much more familiar with Indian nationalist history than Indian internationalism. And uh, students of international relations, particularly uh, uh, in, in the West, will read something like The 20 Years Crisis by E.H. Carr and think that they have understood the 1920s. So would you like to end just by saying, uh, what do you hope this book sort of helps us to, uh, to see the 1920s uh, through, through fresh eyes. Is there, is there anything that you were hoping to uh, achieve in that regard? Thank you, yeah, uh, but before I answer that, I just wanted to thank uh, sort of Arati uh, who sort of made those wonderful comments uh, in, in the chat earlier. So I'm, I'm, I'm deeply grateful for those. Um, I had sort of two aims when I was sort of set out to write this book. Uh, one was as a diplomatic historian, uh, you know, I wanted to write about pre-independence uh, India uh, and basically argue that there is diplomacy before independence. It doesn't really start in 1947. Uh, and this is a kind of work that, you know, a lot of, lot of us uh, sort of, sort of uh, doing new diplomatic histories are doing, sort of looking at sort of continuities between pre and post independence. So there, there's that's one sort of uh, you know uh, concerns uh, or uh, one one motive for writing this book. Um, but also I've and this is something I gestured towards in the beginning. Uh, I'm 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 deeply annoyed at times by sort of Wilsonian liberalism. This idea that Woodrow Wilson you know gave this great idea of self determination to these lapping masses in the non-West and you know Woodrow Wilson is the great universalizer and everyone just else just follows him. Um, Woodrow Wilson is this global figure, everyone else is this provincial figure. And one of the things I wanted to do with, with, with Sastry was tell his story as a global figure. So, I mean, and I, I start a book with, uh, and that's a deliberate decision uh, of, you know, when Sastry arrives in Canada and, you know, how he's received in Canada, uh, and not really with Sastry in India, because to me, Sastry is somebody who's as much as a protagonist of the liberal international order as Woodrow Wilson is. Uh, in some ways, Woodrow Wilson with all the power behind him, it's much easier for him to talk about something. Uh, but for somebody like Sastry, you know, to articulate this vision and constantly negotiate it, uh, uh, and constantly negotiate sort of alternative versions of whatever uh, liberal internationalism, uh, to me, that that that's a valiant effort, uh, an effort that's worth recognizing. So the 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 book, uh, I hope, in a way, sort of presents Shastri not as an appendage to Woodrow Wilson, uh, but as sort of an autonomous figure in his own right, because I do feel that the tendency when we write about, and Ian, you would know much more, and I'll finish there, uh, 
is that when we write about human rights and liberal international and so on and so forth, these tend to be presented as either very abstract ideas or in terms of intellectual histories. The fact is that all of these ideas were thoroughly thought sort of, you know, and sort of thought through and the people, you know, uh, you know, uh, thought about these ideas, articulated them, uh, and literally also thought about these ideas, you know, and, and, and anti-colonial struggles. And diplomacy is one site where these ideas are, you know, thoroughly, uh, you know, um, uh, debated and contested, and then, you know, uh, uh, you know, they, they come to light. They're not just abstract ideas, just thought of, come, that come from somebody's mind and just sort of, you know, are forced on others. So that's that's the, uh, that was the other aim of the book, uh, to present, you know, uh, sort of this all, uh, sort of not a non-Western, I wouldn't say, but present sort of Sartre as a protagonist in his own right, just as uh, several other, you know, um, people from the global south uh, were. Well, thank you so much, Vinny. You know, it's been a pleasure to discuss this with you. It really is, everybody, uh, a remarkable book. It's a, it's an, in, an incredible piece of scholarship. Uh, um, we, we should be very grateful to Vinny for the, yeah, the very careful piece of scholarship that he's produced. It's also a terrifically uh, exciting book to read. Uh, and I hope that all of you can uh, go out and, and, and read it now. Uh, perhaps you could, I don't actually have my copy with me, sadly, uh, but here is the, the book and you can all see the, the, the cover there. Um, and thank you for all of us for joining us tonight. And, and thank you again to Bangalore International Center. Uh, thank you, Vineet, and thank you, Ian, uh, for bringing to us Abir Shastri's Life and Times. Uh, by all accounts, he was a fascinating person and an articulate uh, advocate for racial equality and securing the rights of uh, Indians. Um, thank you audiences for joining us today. See you next time. Thank you everyone.